pursuing scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captain of a scientific technological elite. We signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Welcome to Technocracy News and Trends broadcast. Uh, Patrick Wood here, Editor-in-Chief of Technocracy News and Trends. Today is June 6, 2019, and today we'll be talking straight up about our favorite topic, technocracy. Story number one is titled The Atlantic, that is The Atlantic Magazine, headline The Green New Deal Has Already Won. This is a very serious article. I recommend if you have the ability to go to the website and read it to do so. I state in my comments, the Green New Deal propaganda bomb has significantly moved the entire Democrat field to the far left, and it has forced many Republicans into a compromised position to adopt elements of it. The Ocasio-Cortez and the Justice Democrats have achieved more than they could ever have hoped for. The article starts out, it's remarkable, a number of polls suggest that Democrat voters now consider climate change to be a top-tier issue, as important as health care. Perhaps even more remarkably, the party's presidential candidates seem to be taking that interest seriously. Jay Inslee has staked his candidacy on the issue. Beto O'Rourke has used a climate proposal to revive his flagging campaign. And Elizabeth Warren has cited the warming planet across a wide set of her famous plans. And it goes on down the list. Every single candidate now has been shoved to the far-left agenda of the Green New Deal. Thank you, Justice Democrats. Thank you, AOC. A very small group of people that have been able to infect the entire nation with their global warming rhetoric and their idiot plan for a Green New Deal. Now, why do I call it an idiot plan? Well, two reasons. Number one. It is sustainable development because it came straight from the United Nations. They just repackaged it, relabeled it, Green New Deal. But it's the same old garbage. I documented this in a couple of articles already on technocracy news and trends. And secondly, it represents technocracy, that economic system invented back in the 1930s that was a resource-based economic system. It's going to do away with price-based economics altogether, do away with currency altogether, property rights, all the other elements that we love about free enterprise. And it was going to be controlled by energy. In other words, how much energy did it take to buy something? How much energy went into make it? So the Green New Deal has just warmed over technocracy and sustainable development straight out of the United Nations. They didn't come up with anything new. They thought they did. Well, they said they did. They came up with nothing new. In fact, I wrote two articles on the fact that, that AOC and the Justice Democrats plagiarized the Green New Deal, lifted the text and the name directly out of documents that date back as far as 2008. That's correct. So in many ways, the Green New Deal has already won. And I would say pointedly that the carrier to make this possible has been that Agenda 21 and Sustainable Development has been spread around to every city, county, community in America. And so it's a very natural thing that the Green New Deal would just float right in on top of it because it is the same thing, just repackaged, just remarketed. So now we see it not only all over our country, but it's also around the world spreading quickly for the very same reason. So now the battle lines have been drawn. We see just how radical the program is. I'm glad in a way that they actually came out and just laid it out in front of the American people. But I'll tell you what, don't laugh at it. Don't treat it like a joke. Don't ridicule Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, by the way. She's fun to ridicule. I've been guilty of it myself, I confess. But don't ridicule her because even if she herself is not the brightest bulb in the box, 
She is taking this propaganda in places where nobody else has ever taken it. Call her what you want. Maybe she's dumb like a fox. Maybe she's brilliant just making an act that she isn't. But she's been able to take this rhetoric to places it never, ever has been before. Article number two. Technocracy operates outside of the left or right political spectrum. This is a very important article written by a journalist in Brooklyn. And it starts out in 1969 when Theodore Rozak wrote The Making of a Counterculture. Do you remember that book? It was at least as difficult to be an optimist as it is half a century later. The United States has spent most of the 60s locked in a bloody, pointless war. At home, its cities had suffered the biggest spike in violent crime since the Great Depression. In the face of all this, Rozak, then aged 37, that was pretty young for that day to be talking about such important things, he conducted a survey of populism among younger generations that was critical in places but recklessly hopeful to the core. It is the young, he wrote, arriving with eyes that can see the obvious who must remake the lethal culture of their elders and who must remake it in desperate haste. By Rozek's reckoning, the one thing these groups shared was an enemy, what hippies called the man or the system or the establishment. He called it technocracy. The scientific managerial approach that sustained a hyper-organized industrial society. For many of Rosneck's generation, the consummate technocrat was Lyndon Johnson's defense secretary, Robert McNamara, former president of the Ford Motor Company. McNamara had tried to run the Vietnam War effort in much the same bloodless manner he brought to the factory lines at Ford with disastrous results. Technocracy was not left-wing. McNamara himself was a Republican, but it wasn't right-wing either. It was, to be sure, a political ideology, to which I would disagree, by the way. It's an economic ideology primarily. The elevation of bureaucracy above freedom and dignity. But voting Democrat or Republican would not defeat it. Nor, Rozak argued, would the tactics that the left had been using for the last few decades. Quote, if the melancholy history of revolution over the past half century teaches us anything, it is the futility of a politic which concentrates itself single-mindedly on the overthrowing of governments or ruling classes or economic systems. This brand of politics finishes with merely redesigning the turrets and the towers of the technocratic citadel, close quote. Yet despite his flaws, Rozak's analysis of technocracy is still illuminating. The 50 years since the publication of The Making of a Counterculture have been good for technocrats and bad for everyone else particularly the young. The major hardships people under 40 now face are nightmarish versions of those Rozak identified. That is, wandering aimlessly in a technocratic economy, subjected to algorithmic surveillance, and dependent for food, recreation, and pretty much everything else on corporations that view people as data points. And yet, nobody on the left seems to be talking about technocracy enough. In the U.S., the radical left is divided. Instead, between Sanders-style socialists and single-issue politicians who can't decide whether capitalism, race, gender, or some intersectional combination of them is the proper lens for analyzing society. If any public discourse about technocracy exists today, it is the bigoted version proffered by the right-wing pitchman. He cites Steve Bannon with his rants about the deep state to Michael Gove, smugly confident that Brexiters are sick of McNamara-ish experts. He concludes, surely one key reason for the left's sheepishness about technocracy is that, by and large, it was left-wing people working in places like Silicon Valley who reshaped technocracy into the enormous, charming monster it is today. Thanks to Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and others, today's technocrats have mounds of digitally reaped data at their disposal, which they use to guide their subjects' thoughts and behaviors more precisely than ever. Like I said, I strongly recommend this article to you to understand a little historical sp perspective. Robert McNamara, by the way, was one of the founding members of the Trilateral Commission. 
and one of his prominent spokesmen during the 1970s. He indeed was a technocrat, and he championed technocracy. So he was indeed a key member of the Trilateral Commission back then, one who had experience in the practical side of technocracy. When Zbigniew Brzezinski brought China back onto the world stage in 1976, it was McNamara-style technocracy that they fed to China. Run it like a machine, guys. Make everything a data point. Social engineering by algorithm. That sounds familiar today, doesn't it? Well, let's switch gears and look at what the United Nations is up to this last week. They held a big conflab down in Nairobi that was a follow-up to the new urban agenda meeting that adopted the new urban agenda in December of 2016. They agreed to meet every so often after that original meeting to discuss the status and progress of the new urban agenda. We've covered the new urban agenda several times on the pages of Technocracy News and Trends. I won't bore you with all of that right now. You can go back and search for it and read it. But a document has been released. I included a link to it at the bottom of this article. And I wrote starting out that the United Nations met in Nairobi to give teeth to the new urban agenda adopted in December 2016. The new strategy lends full ideological support to the global Green New Deal movement. Every city on the planet will be inundated with the new propaganda. And I have to say that the, the document that they unloaded on the Internet that uh, all these nations agreed to down in Nairobi, you might want to wade through it and, and read it. I'll read you the first paragraph. You'll get the idea, however, very quickly that the United Nations is making decisions for you on how you should live in the city and how cities should be structured. Their document starts out, Sustainable urbanization is central to the realization of the global development goals as set out in the suite of global agreements signed in 2015-16. Now, when they talk about the suite of global agreements, we've also documented that very carefully in the pages of Technocracy News and Trends. That includes the Global Warming Convention in Paris, and it includes the new urban agenda meeting that happened soon after. So it includes, most importantly, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the new urban agenda. The United Nations Human Settlements Program, which is called UN Habitat, Strategic Plan 2020 to 2025 focuses on the agency's commitment and contribution to the implementation of these global development agendas. Through its normative and operational work, the agency's objective is to, quote, advance sustainable urbanization as a driver of development and peace to improve living conditions for all. Nice sounding platitude, but just the opposite will occur. The strategic plan lays out a recalibrated vision and mission and a sharpened focus. UN Habitat purposes to serve member states, subnational and local governments. Uh-oh. Local governments would be where you and I live and other key urban actors in pursuit of four mutually reinforcing and integrated domains of change or goals. Number one, reduce poverty and spatial inequality in urban and rural communities. And notice they include rural communities as well as urban. Number two, enhance shared prosperity of cities and regions. Note regions implies regional governance, which we are being inundated with in America today. Number three, strengthened climate action and improved urban environment. And number four, Effective Urban Crisis Prevention and Response. It goes on to say the realization of these outcomes is supported by a certain number of specific drivers of change and organizational enablers. Transformative change can only take place through a paradigm shift. In other words, everything needs to change. 52-card pickup? That sounds like Green New Deal to me. UN Habitat is cognizant of this and proposes a clear framework that takes into account global trends and focuses on 
customized solutions taking into account countries and different situations, aligning all efforts focused on the change we want to see, side note, the change they want to see, not you, leveraging partnerships with sister United Nations entities, the private sector, and other development actors and stakeholders, and significantly enhancing integrated delivery through more effective collaboration across its country offices, regional offices, liaison offices, and the headquarters. However, implementation of the Strategic Plan 2020 to 2025 equally requires organizational changes and a new model for financial sustainability to ensure that UN habitat resources are commensurate with its mandates and roles. Translated into action, the strategic plan will reinforce UN Habitat's place as a global center of excellence on sustainable urban development, offering solutions that help seize the opportunities presented by urbanization while bringing about the transformational change for the benefit of millions of people, ensuring that no one and no place is left behind. The bottom line, if you read through it, is they promise utopia and they'll deliver you dystopia. I'm Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. See you next time. Mm-hmm.